right, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. <coughs> Matthew chapter 21. Uh, last week, we read the part, remember, where Jesus uh, rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Remember that? He's riding into Jerusalem, and all the crowds are cheering. There's this huge celebration around him, and... and uh, He's, he's made a name for himself as this amazing prophet, and he's coming into Jerusalem. There's no doubt that a lot of that, that some of that anyways, was, was genuine love for him. But a lot of it was not. A lot of it was just spectacle. A lot of it was, you know, uh, hoopla. People were getting excited uh, by, by the event. And soon, the same city would have crowds of people uh, shouting out for his crucifixion. Today, the title of the sermon asks us a question of our own hearts and how religion is practiced here in the United States of America. And the, not, you remember WWJD, what would Jesus do? This is what would Jesus think of the church today? What would Jesus think of the church today? And to answer that question, we're going to travel back in time 2,000 years to that day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and we're going to see what happens next. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21 from verse 7. His disciples, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, the house, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And if you're not familiar with the story of Christ and you think he's just a, a nice, precious moments figurines on the shelf at Walgreens, that probably took you by surprise. That uh, nice, precious Jesus uh, walks into the temple and he starts flipping over tables and he's driving people out. And uh, it seems in scripture that he actually did this twice. But now he's doing it at the end of his ministry. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But then the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children shouting uh, in the temple courts, Hosanna, son of David, they all believed. Well, my translation is a little different. It says they were indignant. So he, he sees Jesus cleaning up the temple. They see Jesus uh, healing people, and they see the children celebrating and praising, and it gets them very upset. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him, because they were shouting out, uh, this is a term for the Messiah. They were calling him the Messiah, the Savior. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, God, have ordained praise? And they left him and went out of the city of, uh, and he left them and went out to the city of Bethany, where he spent the night. Early in the morning, here's another story that if you're not familiar with the story of Jesus, it's going to take you a little bit by surprise. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. And I've read that this was not the season to find figs on a fig tree, and Jesus would have known that. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When his disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, and not only can you do what has been done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So we have a situation where thousands of people across the known world, uh, because the Jewish people were scattered, they were living uh, all over the known world, they were, they were uh, famous for being involved in, in trading and in, in, in as craftsmen, as also as warriors. 
Uh, there was a large Jewish population in India that were mercenaries, and they'd be hired by the, by the various uh, Hindu kings there for their battles. And there was, they were so well known for their prowess that some Hindu kings would not go to battle on a Saturday because the Jews wouldn't fight on the Sabbath. And so, so the Jewish people were scattered everywhere. Thousands of people then from, from all over the known world, uh, mostly Jews, but also probably some God-fearing Gentiles as well, are all headed to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Uh, a Passover can fall from anywhere from the end of March to May. This year I looked it up and it's going to happen in the middle of April. But the Jewish calendar is not the same as ours, so it's going to be a little different every year. But I want you to try to put yourself now in, in that setting. Just try to imagine what that must have felt like. This is before the days of CNN. You know, there's no satellites, there's no television. And so all year you're looking forward to this uh, pilgrimage and people from everywhere you're going. And the thing is, the closer you get to the city, right, the more people you see all around you. So multitudes of people from lands near and far converging on Jerusalem to celebrate the Lord's goodness, to celebrate remembering when God saved them out of Egypt. And historians estimate that there were about 6 to 7 million Jews in the Roman Empire and about another 1 million in the Persian Empire. And many would now be converging on Jerusalem. As the people get closer and closer, they're going to be meeting up with more and more people on the road. Some are bringing animals to sacrifice there at the temple. Uh, those from farther away, probably not. They're thinking they'll buy their, their sacrifice uh, there at the temple. People are singing to one another. We saw that last week, and it's exciting. It's like going to the fair, maybe, or some other big event in a major city, but only it's better. Because you're not going there to waste your money on rides or something. Or, uh, the people are going to the house of God. This, the, their, their life revolves around God, and they're going there to celebrate the Lord, God's temple on earth in the holy city of Jerusalem. And the closer they get, the more people like them. See, the Jewish people would be isolated in the Roman Empire, right? They were looked down at. They were looked down on. They're outcasts. But more and more as you get closer, there's more people just like you. Not everybody is speaking the same language anymore at this point. You live in Persia for a long time. You learn, live in Greek-speaking lands or Latin-speaking lands for a long time. You start to speak different languages in your family. The children grow up different. So there's a lot of different languages present there. But these people are united by their heart. And so you're getting closer and closer to the, to the temple. You're seeing more and more people just like you going to be with God's people, to offer, offer a Passover lamb to commemorate when God's wrath passed over the people who in faithful obedience supplied the blood of a lamb to the doorpost. And we saw last week that was foreshadowing of when we apply the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, that he shed for us on the cross to our hearts, and then God's wrath passes over us. The city is crowded. I mean, can you imagine the smells, all those people and all those animals and the smell from the temple with, with like streams, literally streams, gullies of blood from all the animals. And, and at this time, they had developed some rituals that weren't even in the Bible, not only with the sacrifice, but then they'd take the heart and they'd squeeze the blood of the, out, out of the heart onto the altar. And just a lot of blood there all the time smells like a butcher shop. Uh, I worked at, uh, this, is, this is totally not in my notes, I worked at uh, Woodman's, and I was my job to clean when they had the butcher shop there once, and I was just new to the place, and I had this high-powered hose, and it's really hot, and hot water, and I'm spraying down this thing. There was trays there, and I took up a tray that was above my head and dropped blood all the way. <laughs> I was soaked, and I had to work my entire rest of shift covered with blood. It was nasty. So imagine being there at this time with all that blood and all the sacrifice, all the sacrifices everywhere, but the people are laughing, and the people are singing, and, and everyone is tired because they've had to travel, you know. But they're glad to have reached the holy city. It's not easy to navigate all those narrow roads, and there's people buying and selling things all around you. And you're trying to get your way to the temple. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort, you know, if you're with children or with, with other people that you've been traveling with. You're trying not to get separated, you know, and, okay, we're going to meet by the camel gate or whatever if we get separated, uh, and, and again, it's not easy, but again, you're just glad to be there. And then there it is right in front of you, the temple. Actually, 
you would have seen the temple from far away. It was gigantic. It was on top of the Jerusalem. Is, you always in the Bible, it always talks about going up to Jerusalem, even if you're going south, because Jerusalem is on a hill. So everything, they always talk about going up to the holy city. And then in Jerusalem, there's a hill on top of the hill, the Temple Mount, and on top of that is this giant building. And, so, and it was made of stones that were white and would shine in the sunlight. So you'd see this shining white temple from, from far away. But now you're standing right in front of the temple, and it is huge. It's actually, at this time, the largest temple structure in the entire Roman Empire. It's just astounding. Herod was known as a great builder in the empire, King Herod the Great, who was, you know, he died about the time Jesus was born. But uh, he, had, he had gone over, he was involved in a lot of things. I mean, if he was part of that whole, you know, part of the Reb, uh, Reb, uh, Rome fighting over to see who was going to be the next leader, and he switched sides in that, and he chose the right side. And uh, he, he was known as this great builder throughout the empire. During his life, he would build two temples to Caesar Augustus because, he, you know, that society chose and he wanted to build a temple to worship Caesar. So he built those all over the place. He built an amphitheater. He built a hippodrome for horse races. He built 11 castles and fortresses, including Masada, which is a very famous uh, fortress. He built towers. The seaport of Caesarea, Caesar is in the name there. Uh, one of the two largest ports in the entire Roman Empire. This guy was something, Herod the Great. He built bathhouses and gymnasiums in many places, including as far away as Tripoli in modern Libya. He built the Herodium, which the Herodium, and there, there was two places called Herodium. Both of them were impressive. But the one near Jerusalem was this artificial mountain. He literally had his engineers build a mountain and then built a palace on top of it with all the luxuries and bathhouses and gardens that he wanted there. Uh, he built a theater in Damascus, Syria, and an aqueduct, an aqueduct for carrying in the water in Laodicea. He built the Pythian temple in the, in the city of Rhodes, but his greatest endeavor was the temple of Jerusalem. And it took so long to build, it was being built, still being built during the time of Christ, Scholars think it was finished just a couple years before the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. Uh, and imagine if that building was still standing, how gorgeous that would be. Uh, to build the temple in Jerusalem, King Herod the Great had, to, had moved the entire top of Mount Moriah off. So he, he builds up one mountain outside of Jerusalem, and here he takes off the top of a mountain so he can make the whole field flat. He leveled it. The stones to build the temple were massive averaging 28 tons apiece. This is huge. The, the, the largest stones were so large, uh, Romans didn't have cranes big enough to move it, so they had to use multiple cranes. Uh, the largest stones were 45 and a half foot by 11 foot by 16 and a half foot and weighed between 567 and 628 tons. This would be an astounding feat even today. He harnessed the, 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 all the power that money could buy in the Roman Empire. Herod hired the best engineers from Greece and Rome. He had an army of 10,000 skilled craftsmen working on every magnificent detail. The front porch was covered in glistening gold, and that would just sparkle in the sunlight from far away. Then over that, kind of a downer, was the unwelcome Roman eagle right over the gate just to let everybody know as they're going into the empire, into the temple, you are under the subjugation of the Roman Empire. But you ignore that. You're just excited to be there. You're not going to let Rome ruin the day, ruin the festival. You content yourself with the knowledge that someday God's going to bring that eagle down. You finally reach the temple courts. There's a lot of courts in there. They're beautiful. And since you couldn't bring a sacrificial animal all the way from Spain or Arabia or India, you brought money. You probably brought the currency of the place where you lived. The courtyard was full of money changers who could help you convert your currency because not only would your currency not work, they wouldn't accept Roman money in the temple. They needed holy money, which provided them an interesting opportunity. And you realize after coming all the way to Jerusalem to worship God, to say, we are the Lord's people. We're here together with all these other people. They've been singing and, and, and praising. The crowd's excited. And you get into the temple itself, 
It is full of people who are trying to rip you off and take advantage of you. Everybody there coming because of their faith in God, being cheated with a stamp of approval from the temple authorities. Using God as a way to rip people off. And you are not happy about it. They're even taking advantage of the poorest of the poor who came because God had set up a provision if you couldn't offer a sin sacrifice of a, of a larger animal like a bull or a lamb, that you could offer a sin sacrifice of a dove. And that in Jesus' own family, remember they sacrificed two doves when they came to Jerusalem when he was a baby and they came to the temple when he was a young boy. And so the poorest of the poor get there to sacrifice a dove. God has set up that provision, his mercy. So everybody, everybody needs to make a sacrifice. They, they need to be able to say, this is what I'm giving to the Lord. But God made it easier for those without any money. And they are being ripped off. The poor. All they could afford, and they're being taken advantage of. And that's sick. And it ticks you off in your soul. You think, this is so wrong. This diminishes the glory of God. They're ruining this sacred event to line their pockets. And as you're getting angry, you hear an uproar and you look over and you, you see the sound. You look over and you see an, a young man who is obviously, he's not happy about it either. He's overturning tables and he's driving these people out and you hear him yell, my house will be a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. And you probably realize he was quoting from the prophet Isaiah, who'd lived in Jerusalem 700 years earlier. And filled with the Holy Spirit of God, Isaiah had proclaimed, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called the house of prayer for all nations. See that? God's idea of the temple. And this, this temple was not the same one Herod built, but it was still gorgeous, and it was covered with rich, rich uh, woodwork and, and uh, gold and bronze everywhere. God, there was a lot of money spent in this, and it was, it was used and designed so that God's people could gather together and praise God. And God said, there's going to be joy in my people, and I'm going to accept their offerings here. And it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations, not just the Jewish people, but everybody is going to celebrate and rejoice because of, of what God is doing there. Coming to the temple was supposed to be a time of joy. And people, motivated by self-interest more than God's glory, were ruining it for everyone. And this angry young man took exception. And your skin, if you were there in that temple, you must have got goosebumps. And you also noticed that in his righteous anger, Temple guards weren't doing anything. And the guys who were ripping everybody off, they were convicted to the point where they couldn't stand against him. They were running, and he was driving everybody out of the court. Your skin gets goosebumps, and you start to ask, who, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And the people answer, he's a prophet, just like the prophets we see in our scriptures. You know, wow, what is, what is God doing here in our day and in our age? So the question is, then, today... We see how Jesus reacted to religion in his time. His harshest words, his harshest actions always reserved for the people who acted religious, for the religious people of his day. How would Jesus respond to American Christianity, to the church today? First off, I want to say, uh, most churches and ministries today the problem is not too much money. Uh, the problem with min but the United States is the richest nation the world has ever seen by far. The church in America is the richest uh, Christianity has ever been by far. And we could be sending out many, many more missionaries and building many, many more churches than we do. But we don't. Because whereas in past generations, uh, Christians all over the place would give a minimum of 10%. Uh, and even in poor countries today, Christians are doing what they can to support their churches. We've been blessed, and our response is, I need to hold on to what I got. And so the problem really isn't. Now, the world thinks that the, there's too much money in the church, and that's what the problem is, but that's really not the case. I've ever actually 
not met a church, and I know a lot of pastors, that aren't struggling just to keep their doors open to pay their bills. However, there's some people that seem to make the news, aren't, th aren't there? Uh, they, they get all the headlines. And uh, these famous so-called churches, so-called ministries that have made religion into big business. And they pretty much all do the same thing. Here's, here's the marks of what they do. They build people up by a relentlessly positive message of health and wealth and, and just believe God and everything will be okay for you. And you've got to demonstrate your faith. And if you, you can demonstrate your faith by making me rich, and then God will make you rich too. And they, they make money by selling people the promise of wealth for themselves. And they tend to talk more about blessings than about sin, the cross, and holiness. They found out that by buttering people up with flattery, telling them only happy, clappy stuff, and by painting pictures of wealth, it makes it easier to get people to open up their wallets. Telling people to deny themselves, you have to endure hardship for the sake of the kingdom, you have to live a life of absolute obedience to the king of, Ken, king of kings, uh, tends to turn people off who just want their ears tickled. That's not how you draw a, a big crowd. But there are other ways that we can use religion to feel our, feed our greed. And, and I think we're all tempted to do it sometime. Well, most of us. How about we're not using religion to get rich, but how about giving money to the church in such a way that we get more influence? Or giving money to the church in such a way that other people can hear the sound of the coins, you know, dropping in in the plate, or, or volunteering so that we boost our image, or people, we're doing things so that people say, wow, look at that person, they're really spiritually mature, or look at that person, they're really serving God. So we can look holy, or look like we're growing in Christ, and really that's just a variation of what the money changers were doing, because we're using religion for selfish ends, and faith in God should be driving us to our knees when we encounter a holy God, we should end up on our knees and say, I'm broken and messed up and you are good. Religion that's building us up, especially then we, if we look down at other people because they're not like us or they don't have their act together, that's not the religion Jesus Christ died to set up. That's not what God was about. I, think about this. God... He's trying to draw people to him because he loves us. He loves us enough that he came down as a human being. He lived life with us. He showed us his beautiful truth. And then he died to pay the penalty of our sins. He took our place for the things we've done wrong, all the nasty things we've ever thought, all the horrible things we've said to the people we love and the way we hurt people we love most, all the selfishness and the hard-headedness and the greed the unforgiving hearts, the bitterness, the cynicism. He died for all of it. And then we turn around and we make religion into a business. We turn around and we make a religion the way, not am I going to glorify God, I'm going to glorify myself. How must that feel for God in heaven? And then we say, we love you, God, and I'm going to use your name to make other people think really wonderfully of me. <laughs> I'm going to use your name to glorify myself. True faith says, God, you are good, and I want everybody to know that. And I want, to, I want to shout this to the whole world. I want everybody to know. I want to lift Jesus up. I want to hold that cross high and let everybody know there's salvation here. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. Come to Jesus. It's not something that we manipulate for our own ends. And it makes God mad when we cheapen what his son went to the cross to establish. Because when the church becomes all about building our reputation instead of bringing honor to God, when it becomes a place we go to feel superior to others, instead of a place where we meet at the foot of the cross with the rest of the world, equal, we're all the same, we all need forgiveness. If the church becomes all about meeting our needs instead of serving others, then it's no longer faith in Christ. It's just another man-made religion. It's empty, it's powerless, and it's pointless. And Christ's ultimate sacrifice then is nullified because we just don't care about what he's done. We care about what it's going to do for us. The Bible also tells us that God's house should be a place of prayer for all people. 
Bible gives us these beautiful images of heaven. It says people from every tribe and every language and every nation are going to be gathered together. At the time of Christ, that was just a seed. It spread quickly from there, and it's been spreading ever since. And today, the Bible is translated, at least a portion of the Bible, into every language on the planet. And every country on the planet has, has at least one church. That came true in my lifetime. That was never true before. And, the, and heaven says every tribe, every language, every nation, God's people, all the people together. And what happens when you walk into an American church? We've got churches where all the, the, the rich young people like to gather. You, you got churches where all the, 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 the cool people gather. You, you have the churches where they play the loud music. You got the churches where they play the organ music. You have the churches for all the people with silver hair. You, you have the churches for, for, the, for the Koreans and the churches for the Hispanics. There's churches for the blacks. You have the churches for people on this side of town. There's churches for people on that side of town. And what would Jesus say if he saw that? Would he say, boy, this don't look like heaven to me? And anything in my heart that caused me to say, what is that person doing here? Or anything in my heart that doesn't want somebody different from me to come and worship together, it's wicked and it's satanic. And God hates it in me. And we want to have this love that anybody who comes through that door, we want to pour love on them, implore blessing on them. What would Jesus think? You've heard that the church is the most segregated, Sunday morning is the most segregated place in America, right? Well, that ought not to be. In fact, that's a shame. That's horrible. Sin of separation versus the beauty of heaven. Every tribe versus segregation. I'm not sure Jesus would be pleased. And Jesus calls on us to pray with faith. Pray with faith. I love to see when people, and they're not, oh, I, all the, I need to, difficult ideas here and there, and they just say, I'm not, it's just, Praying with faith, simply reading scripture and saying, okay, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to come to Jesus. I'm just going to pray with faith in my heart. Real faith, praying, God, unleash, unleash your glory in our midst. God, do something beautiful in our church and in our families. Lord, let me tell you what faith doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, God, you're really good, and you know I love T-bone steak, so I demand that you give me a T-bone steak this afternoon. Well, I'll tell you what, God's got something good cooking up downstairs. <laughs> but uh, real faith doesn't mean that I dictate to God what the only acceptable outcome is. How in the world is that faith? God, you have to do this according to my will, because I really don't trust your will. But I've got a lot of faith that you're going to do what I want. What is that? That's the force. And God saying, yeah, you know that doesn't work on me, right? <laughs> How does that even look like faith? It doesn't mean we demand that God do what we want. It means that we humble ourselves to the Lord. Remember what Christ said before the cross when he's, when he's weeping in the garden, he's crying out, he says, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because he said, if there's any way that this cup could be taken from me, <coughs> but God... Not my will, but your will be done, Father. And remember, how did Christ teach us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in, in heaven. Christ told us, taught us to pray. Remember who's up there, remember who's down here. We're about establishing his kingdom, not our own personal little kingdoms. It's about his will being done, not our will being done. That's faith. When we, when we trust enough to let God's will be done. God, you can't tell me how to run my marriage. Well, that's not faith. God, you can't tell me how to run my finances. That ain't faith. God, you can't tell me how to raise my kids. That's not faith. Faith is when we say, okay, God, by the way, I'm looking in here, and I don't want to trust what's in here with my family or my finances or my, my children with anything. Faith is when we say, okay, God, your ways are higher than my ways, and that's easy for me to see. Lord, your ways are so much better than my ways. And Father, I want to I follow you for everything I've got. I want to just lay down my life, Lord, and follow you for everything I've got. Your kingdom, God, your will on earth just as in heaven. We need more people who will simply read the Bible. Just read the Bible. 
and just start praying. Just read the Bible and pray. Pray with confidence. Don't, don't parse words with God. Don't, don't twist the scriptures into some good luck charm. Just believe God and pray and do it again. And, and when you prayed, start praying some more. The American church has a lot of problems. Too much prayer is not one of the problems. The Holy Spirit has never convicted us for praying too much. Let's get on our knees and uh, fight like men. God wants real faith. If Jesus came to the church today, he'd be looking for people who really just simply believe. Let's say God says, I'm perfect, I'm holy, and I'm good. And they say, yeah. And God says, and you're made in my image, and I love you. And they say, yeah. And then God says, but you know what? The human race has fallen. It's sinful. It's messed up. It's broken. You say, I know. I look around. I turn on the news, and I see it. But even more, I see it right inside here. And even when I'm trying to do good, there's conflicting motives behind my brain, and there's, there's, this, there's this shadow of selfishness over everything I do, and God, I believe you. And then God says, and I will forgive you. I died on the cross for you. And a person who believes say, I believe that, and I'm going to take that forgiveness. I don't feel like I deserve it, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to take that forgiveness, and Jesus says, follow me. And you said, okay, where are we going? And Jesus is looking for faith. And what do we think? We know better? Come on, people. Do you really look inside? Have a little bit of introspection. Do we really honestly think we know better? Jesus is looking for faith. Jesus goes to this great temple. You know what? He doesn't marvel at its grandeur. If I had gone there, I would have. And, and I think that's okay. I don't think God... It, but the thing is, don't get fixated on the building, right? Jesus cared about the people in the building. We care about big, beautiful buildings. He cared about the people in the building. Instead, he attacks this anti-God mentality about, uh, from, that was found in the religious people. This anti-God mentality that was driving people who wanted to know him away. And does the church in America act in such a way that people are seeking for God get driven away because of us? It's a rhetorical question, but you can think about it. And then Jesus curses a fig tree. What is up with that? I don't like this tree. Bzz. Boy, I'm feeling kind of hungry today. Ain't nothing on you. You will never have fruit again. Jesus is kind of weird. Just as Jesus went to the temple in Jerusalem, and he found no spiritual nourishment there, he goes to this tree. There's no nourishment there. People go to the temple. And they were not finding anything to sustain them spiritually. When Jesus says, you will never bear fruit again, he's talking about the temple system. And then he tells his disciples, <coughs> you're going to do greater things than this, than withering a plant or, or moving a mountain if you pray with faith. And guess what? Where he was speaking, just a few miles from him, remember that artificial mountain I was talking about? The Herodium that Herod built? Just a few miles from where he was with this artificial mountain. Herod moved it with the power of man. And right there in the temple was based on a mountain that was leveled off and moved by the power of man. <coughs> and Jesus said, if you work with faith and prayer, you're going to do greater things than moving mountains. The man-made mountain, the temple, shaped, uh, the temple shaped by Herod's army of servant, two human-made uh, mountains by human standards were wonders of the world, but they were nothing in God's eyes. And any time his people, listen to this, Anytime his people learn to forgive because they have that, the power of the Holy Spirit within them, repent of their sins, learn how to really care for people that irritate them, learn how to say, want the best for people that have hurt them. Anytime in the human heart there's nastiness, a light shines on it, and people say, I don't want to be like this anymore. I'm too hard on people. I'm too bitter. I'm too critical. Anytime God shines his light and, and people are awakened to the reality of God and they change, God's much more impressed with that than building some artificial mountain or having 600 ton rocks. God made the earth and the moon and a trillion, trillion stars. He's not that impressed by 600 ton rocks. When hard, cynical, self-righteous hearts turn to Jesus and tears melt the hardness inside, 
God says, that's greater things. In my economy, in the things I value, that is greater things than the tallest skyscraper, than the richest man on Wall Street. This is greater things when hearts turn and people learn to love one another and, and forgive one another. Is greater. In the realm of things that God values, a hard, self-righteous bigot becoming a humble, gentle, and loving soul is worth more than artificial and abusive religion. In God's eyes, just a teenager, just a young pup, learning to live and walk by faith daily and praying before they go to their job and praying before they go to school and praying at school, and they're starting to share their their faith in Jesus, they're sharing the gospel with their friends and at the lunch table and, and, and standing in line, they're talking about Jesus. That's worth than a th more than a thousand grand building projects. And God loves it. Jesus had no use for King's Herod constru King Herod's constructions or the cold calculations of the money changers. He did care about personal holiness. He cared about truth, about people being able to joyfully praise God together, finding their joy in the God, in God, in communication with God. You know, we think prayer, it sounds so magical. Prayer is talking with God, talking with our Heavenly Father. And Jesus cared very strongly that people were able to do all of these things without fake religion getting in the way. Jesus himself, this is not a sermon against institutionalized religion. Jesus made the institution of the church. Jesus established the church. He died for the church. The church, he calls it his bride. Jesus loves the church. Show me how you can have authentic biblical Christianity and say, I don't want to be part of the body of Christ. I'm just going to do this on my own. Well, you might be doing some kind of religion, but it's not the religion that God set up right here. Okay? So this is not an anti-religion or anti-church message. But I'm pretty sure God would not be entirely happy with the business we've made of it. What a shame. The bride of Christ. Isn't that a beautiful term? Right here, the bride of Christ. Jesus said, I lay down my life for the bride. I love the bride. I want to be in relationship with the bride for eternity. What a shame that the bride of Christ in America were to put on makeup dress itself up so we resemble something built by King Herod or corporate America. And people coming to church to find truth. They're looking for truth, something real, something, something genuine that I can hang my life on, something I can build my life on. They're looking for love. They're looking for somebody to accept them as they are. And instead, they're accosted by people peddling religion. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the church Jesus died, died to establish. The church is important to Jesus. He died for it. And at least in Christ's eyes, the difference between that fake religion and true faith are worth upsetting some tables and some people. Fighting for a real relationship with God instead of settling for this imitation is worth turning over some tables and upsetting some people. Before I close, I want to emphasize again There's nothing wrong with big, beautiful buildings. And when I see a big, beautiful church, I think there's faithful people there. There's people there who, are, who, who have given and sacrificed. And when I know what's going on in the church, and I know it's a, a Bible-based church, I'm just so thankful. And I drive by the church, and I say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what's going on in that church. So I want to emphasize there's nothing wrong with a big, beautiful building. It can be a very useful tool to help minister to the gospel, to bring people in, to, 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 to bless the community. Twice in the Old Testament, God called the people to build large and ornate and expensive temples. These buildings were, were huge and magnificent. And the people responded, the Bible talks about how they were giving joyfully. And everybody was coming and bringing their offering. And God blessed their giving because it was done for his glory, not for human glory. But let's keep in mind, just one soul. Just one soul taken off of the highway to hell to this journey to eternal destruction and brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ is worth more than all the great temples and churches of the entire world combined, just one soul, just one soul. And the church building is not the church, but the church building, the purpose of it 
is so we can bring that one soul and then one more soul and then one more soul. And we keep reaching out. And our weapons are not of this world. We're not taking over the world with, with guns. We're not going to change the world at the, at the ballot box. We're changing the world one soul as a at a time as people realize God is real and God is good. And I want to be part of that. <coughs> and then God talks to them and they say, but it's not just enough. It's not just enough for me to be here. I've got to go get my friends and my family and my coworkers, and we need to bring more people into the body of Christ. But it's one soul, one soul at a time, worth more than, than all these physical things combined. Christ died to win people to his kingdom. We should live our lives and die our deaths to do the same. We don't need grand productions. We need to really love God, put him first in our lives, we need to love other people enough to let them know there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. There's, new, there's life in the name of Jesus. Let that be true of uh, each one of us, and let that be true of our church. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.